We are with Jacqueline Schwab, who is playing Building Bridges, Vintage Music of Latin America, and we're gonna talk about a few things. Um, how on earth did you get your beginning? Well, I think I started playing when I was about four, and somehow I'll skip over a lot, but, but, but also that my grandmother was a wonderful pianist, and I still own her 1917 Steinway Parlor Grand, and I remember her. And in some ways, my music still sits in that era. And when I was young, I had the fortune to get a really top-notch private teacher, not for piano, but for um, learning composition and uh, the, the fundamentals of music, ear training. And she was from England. She had taught at Eastman. But uh, she was from England. I encountered her in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, but she was really the first one to introduce me to, to Latin, vintage Latin music, because the music of her era um, also drew on it. I'm thinking of Ravel, you know, the Bolero, and, and other pieces. And I actually wrote a habanera when I was about eight, and orchestrated it when I was 10. I had forgotten that until recently when a friend remembered and reminded me. So you got the nuts and bolts of music right along with the passion. So I was really lucky. And then somewhere in my teen years, I fell in love with folk dancing. I was really shy, and it totally saved my life in high school. And I barely made it out of high school, but um, even though I was taking AP courses, but mostly I was folk dancing every night of the week. And that really eventually infused my music. And, and then I joined a folk dance band, which I'm still part of. And somewhere along the way, I found my way to Boston and um, was lucky enough to find a very special program at New England Conservatory of Music. Uh, it was then called Third Stream, now it's called Contemporary Improv. Um, but it really melded, while I was there, melded the stream of um, traditional folk music with jazz and with 20th century, it was the 20th century then, 20th century classical um, compositional techniques. So we were, we were encouraged to really form a personal voice too, which was a great for me, because I already <laughs> was, was the kind of person who had to do it my own way. And um, it, it, they really fostered us, and I was very lucky to find that program. Were rehearsal and research and performance all parts of this? Uh, it, it could have been, um, and in my case I actually worked with uh, the head of history department at the undergrad NEC uh, and studied um, uh, Renaissance dance and then uh, Baroque dance a little bit. Uh, and again, those are very specialized fields. I was, they, were, we, they were just introductions to them. But that did lead to my exploring English country dance music history um, at Boston University in an interdisciplinary program, the University Professors Program. And I had already uh, spent much of my life at that point uh, deeply involved in English country dance, uh, which is still part of my life. And, and dance communities are, uh, are, are just amazing. You can, if you join a dance community anywhere, you can go somewhere else in the world and meet friends right away. So it's, it's a wonderful thing. And you can have two left feet. It's not a performance. Thing. It's really for one's own enjoyment. And that really did affect my music making quite a lot. Although then, um, I, uh, because of um, the first recording of my band, Bare Necessities, uh, it was heard by documentary um, filmmaker Ken Burns. And he gave me the call to be on his Civil War series. And that um, changed my life in many ways. It didn't bring me fame and fortune, but it did bring me um, a new way of playing the piano uh, in the sense of that he was really encouraging um, music that uh, responded to the story and that breathed. And also because he was working with stills, he recorded the music first and then fit the picture to, to the music. That's not the normal way of doing it. Unlike many filmmakers, uh, Ken Burns' films, in many cases, give the sense of the music driving a part of what the film is about, and that for me is enormously 
joyous to realize. For a musician, yeah, especially. But maybe I think for apparently he's spoken to many other people. I mean, he's there's a lot that he has given us in his films. But I think that is one of the things. But before that, you went on to graduate school. And what moved you to, <laughs> to take this big step out of NEC into the graduate world? Well, I didn't know what to do with myself. <laughs> and I did have this passionate interest in English country dance music. This is, we're talking, um, its origin, the first publication was 1651, and then it continues up. And I decided that I was, and because I had been the mentor, ment, mentored by this, by Julia Sutton, who is a Renaissance dance um, expert at NEC, she really sort of spoon-fed me, handed me into wanting to study the history of dance and dance music. And um, that narrowed down to a bibliography of 18th century country dance music, but I'm ABD, I never finished all but dissertation. I never finished my dissertation, and uh, somewhere along the line, I was living mostly in England, and had a boyfriend there, and um, was running a dance camp in the US. I was just doing too many things, and something, many things had to go, so the boyfriend went, the, uh, uh, yes. <laughs> the graduate program went, just about everything mm -hmm. went, except playing, playing piano. Did Playford step early into your life, or was Playford before the period you were looking at then? Uh, well, I was looking at 18th century, but I did fall in love with Playford dances when I was a teenager dancing in Pittsburgh. And this is a strange vignette that <laughs> you weren't expecting probably, but my grandmother, the pianist, uh, when I was in high school and looking at the, these um, music books written by a 20th century um, Cecil Sharp, who had gone back to the Playford yes. stuff and uh, it had printed sheet music so people could play for dances. It would, um, just like that's been done with dance music time and time again. Well, he said, she said, oh yeah, Cecil Sharp, I played for him. And <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was quite something. But um, uh, my grandmother, though, was, a, was really pretty much strictly classical. So that was just a job for her. But I was tickled to, to find out that I think she did. I'm not, I haven't. I haven't really documented that, and she died. She, she, by the time I was interested in documenting it, it was too late to. Was she find a presence it. in your life, and her the message she was giving you um, at the time you were pursuing graduate studies? It sounds like a very deep seated thing. Yeah, I think by the time I was in graduate studies, um, she lived to be two months short of her hundredth year, but she, but, but she, her, her mental ability declined when she hit mm -hmm. her nineties. Although she could still, I could play Bach and she would finish the phrase singing it. So that's an encouraging thing for any musician. Maybe we'll keep some a part of our brain. I've read that this is common. Anyway, I'm sorry, I'm picking so us you, off the topic here, but. You made it through graduate school and then out into the big bad real world <clears throat> where we all end up and we're practicing musicians end up. And, <laughs> or our uh, hobby, as some people call it. <laughs> you were, you were uh, playing sound scores for film of a different kind than most people would think of. You were playing in bands, um, you were playing around, you were also doing solo things, and gradually uh, I get the idea that you were becoming interested in themes in folk and in, um, in the demotic popular culture. And that gets us to today, where we are. What brought you on board the idea of building these bridges of traveling the road of vintage Latin American music? I, I would say I do credit my work with Ken Burns for, for organizing my music into themes. So from an English country dance pianist, I became an Americana pianist and I did a program for a while called Mark Twain's America. And uh, it really Which gave you me did the- here. I did hear, uh, yes, yes. I was, that's how we met actually, yeah. And um, it really, um, it's, he's a very expansive person. I mean, he's, he's so charismatic and so um, full of ideas and so good at explaining them and, and, um, and conveying them to people. 
a, a kind of like a sorcerer in a way. I think he sort of he and listens the music things with, with people. which he was associated. And and um, so I think he gave me the idea that oh, I could do concerts of American music. Um, I I don't claim to be an expert. I don't claim to be a musicologist. My foray into the Boston University and the degree gave me a great appreciation for those who are musicologists and who really uh, spend most of their life in the library or now on the internet and, um, uh, and, and do that work, um, and which I started out on that path, but I really wanted to be a pianist. And so, but my association with Ken really gave me the confidence to, on a small scale, you know, to, to say, well, I could create a program of this and this. And also, I would credit the folk community and my bandmates who mm -hmm. were inveterate explorers of all kinds of music and having been to so many camps where you might hear somebody who sings sacred harp and sings, I know you have, a, you have great folk music in your background and, and, and people, who, who, people who had done quite a lot of, who had grown up in the folk tradition or who had done a lot of work in sharing that music, I had I sort of sponged it up at, at folk camps. And so I did that with the Mark Twain and then um, I think I was looking for personal growth, and that coincided with a time when it really seemed like that instead of walls, we wanted to build bridges. And um, I had already been playing more and more um, Latin music at folk dances. We, you know, we might end with a, a, a Latin waltz, even though it's not an English country dance waltz, but we would we'd do that. And so it made me think, well, why not really take this on, and that my program sits from different parts of my life. I'm not playing today a piece by Ernesto Lecona, but it's a piece that my high school teacher handed to me to play. Of course, it was way beyond my reach then. Um, and the Ernesto Nazare that I'm going to play, I learned, I first was introduced by a, a housemate in the 80s who was taking tango, and he just and also um, the Castro piece, he just said, oh, Jacqueline, you have to play these pieces. So and the I'd music look... is, uh, although it came together in this program for you fairly recently, it goes way back in your performing mm. and mm. ensemble and social life. It does, but I really do call this program, I'm a beginner, I'm taking baby steps. I'm like at Spanish 101 in the sense of, I mean, I'm a, a full-blown musician, I've been performing. Well, you're taking uh, baby steps in public. <laughs> Here, so, so um, it really is learning another language, and I would like to learn Spanish and Portuguese. We have a Portuguese neighbor, and so he, I've been getting coached a little bit, and, 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 uh, and, a, and a bandmate of mine has gone many times, I mean, not Portuguese, uh, a Brazilian neighbor, sorry, and a bandmate of mine has gone many times to Brazil and has learned Portuguese, and has shown me pictures of her trips and just got me enthused. But really working on the music, I think I gave my first Building Bridges program in uh, 2017. And mm -hmm. when I look back, um, it, I have grown a bit with the music. And I hope four years from now, I'll have grown that much at least again, because it's a lifetime. As we begin to, to discuss this program, putting it together for the live concert that will now probably not take place, <laughs> uh, and here we are instead in front of microphones in the empty Bagrua Center, um, you said that you found yourself wonderfully challenged by it. It pushed a lot of your limits oh. in terms of expression, but also technically. And um, one of the things that brought you here was the offer of playing uh, a 19th century American concert band. Uh, this one happens to be by Chickering, but it could have been a Mason and Hamlin or a Steinway. What does an instrument like this have to say about this repertoire? This one was made in 1886, just as this movement was getting started. It was really mind-bending, and I just feel like I'm still on my first date with this piano. <laughs> and I really enjoyed playing it, playing it, but um, it is, we're still on just kind of first date status. It takes a while to know any piano, and, and this one has um, a very different touch. Um, 
it in some senses really harkens, it's, it's come quite a ways from a forte piano, uh, but it's still, and you know, I can, I can do quite a range of dynamics on it, or at least the piano could have that range, and I try, but, um, it, but the actual touch, in a sense, is, 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 harkens back in some ways, I think, to what I've experienced when playing forte piano. It's very nuanced. Yeah, it's very nuanced and clear, the clarity, I immediately discovered all kinds of things I had missed in my practicing that, you know, had just gotten washed over in my home. And I have a beautiful Steinway at home, but, uh, but and also the space too, that you can resonate in the space. But the bass is so clear here, it inspired me to learn the third part of one of the Nazarite pieces that I had kind of mm -hmm. ignored before because it had just seemed too growly. But on this piano, it's just, it, it, it just seems celebratory and clear. And um, an instrument like this is a, an interesting tool to delve further into a score and maybe even see what was written literally because there might have been a reason for that. I feel like I've learned just so much today. In fact, I'm ready to do the recording again because in a sense it, it's taught me a lot about these pieces that I'll take with me to the next situation um, but yeah it's, it's, it's really a gem and um, it also it's, it's made me think about balance uh, balance between the bass and the treble and sometimes that's a matter of volume and sometimes it's a matter of just intention uh, that, if, that if I really have an intention to play a low note it could be very soft. I didn't always achieve that, but it could be very soft and still be heard if it's played in the right way against the Throughout top. Throughout the 19th century, if you will, pianos gave performers permission to imbalance the dynamics of parts, knowing that all would be audible. And you could even have a third quiet part in the middle, as you were saying, and the instrument would do it. It's not what modern pianos are about by any means, but it is what these uh, wonderful rosewood monsters from the 19th century are about, and it has been magic to record you. Uh, it's really good. special. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. For a, uh, for a Lagrua public who have grown to know it and to, the, to know the Mason and Hamlin room over in the corner. I, my music, I think thanks to my work with Ken Burns, has grown up, music making has grown up with a lot of space in it. I'm actually a pretty anxious person, as you probably discovered, but, but when my music really goes, it, it can have a breathing in it. But the way I make that happen on my Steinway is to kind of stroke a note. And I haven't learned how to do that on this piano yet. So, I mean, it may be quite possible, but I, it didn't seem like that was going to get the things I do at my home piano didn't achieve that space sense. So I had to think mm -hmm. of I don't what could make it happen and whether or not I achieved it or not. It was just so stimulating to it's just a whole thought of a different way to play the piano. So. Well, I would like to thank you very much for having joined us. Oh, thank and you so much. We look forward to. Um, hearing people's responses to this evocative, uh, wonderfully diverse programming, and uh, we wish you happy viewing.